Hello everyone and welcome to Family Group Conferences, Current State and Future Directions. Thank you to those of you who completed the pre-work. You'll see that empowerment came out strongly as one word you would use to describe the key reason Family Group Conferences are important. We have less of a consensus as to the biggest challenge, but we'll hear shortly what our speakers today think. I'm David Fairhurst, Executive Chair at Mutual Ventures, and I'll be chairing this morning's discussion. This is the fifth in a series of webinars that Mutual Ventures are hosting throughout September and October on a range of important topics for the public sector. Mutual Ventures are advisors in public service improvement and innovation, and over the last decade we've supported delivery of national programmes such as the Children's Social Care Innovation Programme, Regional Adoption Agencies and the Strengthening Families Protecting Children programme. Family Group Conferences, or FGCs as we'll refer to them, have featured significantly in these programmes, with pilots led by the likes of Family Rights Group seeking to test and improve the way that FGC is applied in practice, whilst other innovations such as Leeds City Council's Family Valued and Stockport Council's Stockport Family have FGC at the heart of their whole system approaches to social care. The purpose of today's session is to hear from some of the country's leading experts and practitioners in FGC to discuss current practice, explore how practice has had to innovate through necessity as a result of COVID-19, and to consider the future for this important element of both children's and adult social care practice. The format of our webinar this morning is a little different from others so far in the series. In essence, it will run a little like BBC's Question Time, only slightly less challenging. I'll step in for Fiona Bruce and will pose a series of questions to our panel of experts. You as our studio audience are all invited to send in your own questions throughout the discussion using Zoom's Q&A function. I'll post some of your questions alongside my own as we go, and we'll also have a general Q&A towards the end. We will finish promptly at 11 a.m., so we can't promise to get to every question, but we'll get through as many as we can. Before we begin our discussion, we have a short introductory video just to get us all in the right headspace. Great. Well, I hope that helped ease you into things. It's now my pleasure to introduce our panel for today. We have Cathy Nooser. Cathy has 30 years experience in children and families social work, working in several deprived boroughs in East and North London. Her specialism is child protection, with extensive experience as a child protection conference chair and independent reviewing officer. She has been actively involved in setting up and running FG services in child welfare for the past 20 years, as well as developing and delivering accredited training for FGC coordinators and advocates. 
She currently manages the FGC services in Westminster and Kensington and Chelsea. Cathy says I was inspired by the FGC model when it first came to the UK and haven't stopped talking about it since. Tim Fisher, happy birthday Tim. Tim has been a social worker for 12 years working in Wales and England. He is currently service manager for Family Group Conference and Restorative Practice at London Borough of Camden. Tim has a strong interest in relational practice across both children and adults work. He's a fellow of the RSA and is a published writer on community approaches. And completing our panel, Professor Peter Marsh. Peter is Emeritus Professor of Child and Family Welfare at the University of Sheffield, having previously been Dean of Social Sciences. He's a Fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences and has over 30 years of experience in social research and entrepreneurship. His long-standing work on evaluating and developing FGCs includes a recent youth project in Italy and an adult services project in Camden. He's a social innovation advisor, currently working on the DfE Strengthening Families Protecting Children programme. Panel, welcome to you all. FGCs are now reasonably widespread in children's services in England. What are the latest developments and trends and how have these been affected by COVID-19? Let's kick off with your thoughts on this, if we may, Cathy. Okay, um, I just wanted to say the video was great and it was really a lovely introduction to it. But I would want to make just a point because I have been going on about FGCs for a long time. The, um, I think it's important to recognise that FGC is more than a meeting, it's a process and the importance of the work of the independent coordinator in the preparation before the meeting is, I think, one of the things that really defines the difference between an FGC and a, a family meeting that a social worker might arrange. So I just, just wanted to, to make, make that point. Um, in terms of where we're at at the moment with FGCs, We've certainly come a long way. There, there's so much more um, embedded into how authorities work. And I think in the last few years, the changes in attitudes towards social work practice have been very helpful. In the time I've been involved with FGCs, a lot of the time it's been a bit of a bolt on um, rather than something that's really integrated into social work thinking. But I think the shifts towards restorative practice, um, systemic approaches have been really helpful in focusing on the, the helping relationship. And that's really created an environment where people can see the logic of FGCs much better. Um, so I think one of the things I've seen is the shift Mostly, I think we still are targeted largely in child protection and pre-proceedings work in most authorities. Um, but there is a shift away from that to actually using FGCs more creatively at an earlier stage of intervention with early help, children in need. Um, and I think that's been that's really encouraging. Um, looked after children there's some interesting work and innovations happening there um, the lifelong links um, project that family rights group supported which is really looking at reconnecting looked after young people with the wider family that they so often lose contact with um, when they come into the care system um, we've been involved with that and that's that's really quite an exciting project it's um the we know how isolated young people often are when they leave care um so this this uh, approach to actually reconnecting with a lot of those people they lose contact with including professionals actually not just family members it might be a, a foster carer who had a particularly good relationship whatever um, and in fact, we had an example um, in uh, the authority I work in where we were working with a young person who had come into care because of neglect. His mother was a substance misuser and he had often ended up in that situation where he went to play with a friend and it turned out then it, his mother didn't turn up like for three days or something. So the friend and the friend's family were really important to this young person. 
And when we did the lifelong links work, those were the people he wanted to really reconnect with. Um, and that was something that really our current system wouldn't in any way accommodate. You know, they had fallen off the end of his world, he had fallen off the end of theirs, despite that they were very concerned about him. So, you know, it's just a, a small example of some of the kind of more creative ways using FGC. Um, the other things we've done, I think, in terms of the child protection process, there's that shift now, I think, to really looking at how that highly proceduralized um, system really impacts on the relationships. And, you know, there are a number of, of authorities now looking at offering family group conference as an alternative to child protection conferences, which, you know, five, six, ten years ago would have been absolutely unthinkable. Um, but that's that's something that's actually happening now, which I think is really encouraging. Um, I think the challenge with that from trying to implement it where I am is um, is really the challenge of overcoming professional anxiety. Um, social workers included are often, you know, they to shift them from the established process can be quite difficult because I think it's something obviously that they're familiar with, but they also feel protected by. And I think that's where the culture in organisations and that overall kind of framework that FGCs can thrive in makes a huge difference so that you're not swimming against the tide. Um, so, yeah, I think that's kind of where I see the developments in children's um, FGC world at the moment. And in terms of uh, the sort of impact of, of COVID, particularly uh, on on the way that FGC is applied, uh, what are your thoughts on that, Cathy? Have you seen, sort of seen the impact, and what sort of innovations have you seen arise as a result? Um, well, we're doing all our FGCs virtually since lockdown, um, and there was kind of an initial hiatus, I think, where people thought wow how do we do this you know fgc plans tend to be so practical and hands-on how do we do this when people are separated in that way um but that it's kind of picked up and people have gotten used to new ways of working i think the coordinators have adapted really well to using the technology um in terms of the negatives the losses Certainly, you know, the conversations over food, over a cigarette break, those kind of informal shifts that happen when families come together, as when professionals come together, um, have been, that's been a loss. But on the other hand, we certainly are getting more people. Um, it's easier to get a wider range of people. It's also quite interesting that in the past, people might have been discounted because they weren't local. Um, well, what can they do if they're so far away? And because everyone's kind of on a level play platform now, it's really highlighted how significant important family members can be, even if they're not living around the corner and, and delivering hands-on support. So I think that's been really, really interesting. I mean, we had a case um, and the family member writing the plan was actually a sister who was in Vietnam, but was very involved in, in how things were working. Um, I think the other big thing really is particularly with young people, um, you know, this is a medium they're very comfortable with. Uh, I think their contribution through through virtual means has, has really been very uh, helpful. And in a way, it really, it's, it's us as professionals catching up, I think. So I think a number of those things will certainly go forward. I can see much more of a kind of mix when we do go back to actual meetings um, using the virtual participation as well. Right. Thanks, Cathy. Tim, did you want to come in there? I think you've got some good examples of your own experience yeah on the on the covid one um we've been doing through the lockdown fgc's virtually um we have done a few um face-to-face uh, -face meetings and kind of 
I don't know if I quite, if I like the term about hybrid. Uh, you know, when you've got some people on video and some people in person in community spaces, and those have gone quite well um, in the past couple of weeks. Um, I think some of the FGCs that we've done, and we kind of coined this phrase early on um, of connection over distance, and we felt that it was important to keep the FGC work going uh, through the COVID crisis, um, partly because that access to decision making, people's rights to um, have an input into the, the decisions that are affecting them it is important. Um, but also as uh, the months have gone by, we've seen the FGC referrals have been made to respond to the COVID context. You know, people that are um, isolating mental health issues, um, relationship conflict. Um, so it's been those two things really, trying to maintain our um, FGC work um, while also bringing through um, new, new referrals responding to the COVID situation. And when we had one, so we've been doing family conferences with adults for the, for the last few years. And I, I liked the word that Kathy used there, connection. Um, because I think connection is a big one for, for FGC. And, um, you know, I like, I like the, the uh, word FG or the, the, the phrase FGC. I think it sort of um, does what it says on the tin. You know, it's about connecting people, about bringing people together um, to make decisions. Um, and there's a strong kind of emotional component to that um, as well. And, you know, the last few months, more than ever, we've all needed to be connected to people, haven't we? It's been really, really important. And um, so some of our referrals that we've been taking via adult social care, uh, mainly from um, adult um, social workers, from different teams, safeguarding teams, learning disability team, mental health team, um, have been addressing those issues of, of connection for people in the community. And uh, we had a situation, um, a man uh, called Brian, who had lived with his brother for a long time, um, for um, nearly 40 years, in his 70s. Um, his brother couldn't look after him anymore. And the social worker was planning a move for Brian to supported living. Um, you know, a lot of disruption there for Brian himself. Um, really um, coming to terms with that uh, change in circumstance um, while COVID was happening and the restrictions on people um, gathering and being physically with each other. So an FGC was held virtually and it enabled the immediate community around Brian, you know, the family, his brother, um, but also some family friends. Um, the care agency were involved as well um, that helped to look after him. Um, and they made a plan of how the move would work, what he needed, how people would stay in touch with him, how they'd manage things like food delivery and other support. And um, it was a really um, key thing for, for Brian through that time. And they had an initial family group conference and, um, and then a follow-up uh, review uh, family group conference. And um, I was struck by the feedback from people at the review uh, that, um, that said that uh, it was a really valuable process for them. And um, where Brian is now, actually his brother has moved out of the big house and moved closer to Brian. And um, you know, they're reporting that they're um, pretty, pretty happy, all things considered. So um, that's a nice one. Okay, thanks, Tim, thanks. Uh, Pete, have you got uh, any thoughts on, on this uh, particular topic, this sort of the, the wider developments, I suppose, uh, in terms of the application of FGC and also um, any particular impacts of, of COVID that you'd like to comment on? Well, although we're being very current, I think um, I'd like a little bit of history, really. Social Work's rather poor at celebrating its history, but in 1989, it was a remarkable piece of legislation about children, the uh, Children Act. And um, in some ways, it seems to me that only in recent years have we come to really uh, enact that act in the best possible way. And family group conferences, I think, are an example of that. I mean, really, 
being respectful to people, trying to move outside of the legal system if we can to get to get agreement, uh, children's right to families, and 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 so on. Um, I think the COVID thing is very interesting. I mean, what you've also got to do, of course, and which I think uh, most authorities have been have been struggling with, is is make certain people aren't um, aren't disenfranchised by it, you know, so that they can get the kit and can get the software and it, and it can be safe. I mean, obviously, you know, you don't quite know what's going on behind the camera and uh, people have established various different ways of doing that. Again, I think family rights groups have been interesting and have got some guidance, which is worth looking at. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Um, Tim, let's go back to, uh, you began talking there about sort of the development into adult care and FGCs in the UK have over the last 10 years or so begun to develop into areas such as adults care and mental health. Um, how has this worked and, and what are the gains and problems that this might now face, do you think? I think you, you saw in the graphic in that little um, nice little video at the start, um, the idea of uh, FGC being a bridge between the life world of people and communities and the system world, which many of us operate in. And, you know, the life world is um, dynamic and fluid and runs on um, unconditional love and uh, us in the system world, we've necessarily got um, time scales and process. And so FGC as that bridge, um, it's actually never a, it's, it's never a perfect fit, you know, and but, um, having that independent coordinator that can operate um, and organize the FGC and bring those people together um, is a really key one. And for us in transferring our, um, significant children's FGC practice, you know, 20 years of, of, of organising FGCs, 30% drop in the number of um, children in care uh, in, in, in Camden. And transferring that practice, for us, we were lucky that we had this established uh, group of um, FGC coordinators that come from a, a broader pool in London um, that uh, uh, speak different languages and could organise these culturally sensitive meetings in the community um, and I think that's when when you get into what an FGC is um, you you're you're onto the territory of strength-based work you're talking about utilizing the assets that are around people in the community and um, starting those conversations with um, what's strong not what's wrong working with people on what matters and I think that's been the shift in adult social care uh, over the last few years. Um, you know, I'm really proud of the work that Camden's doing um, on its What Matters program um, uh, across the piece. And um, uh, our FGC work has, has, has really been able to um, uh, be emblematic of that um, and be a, um, a, a way of um, uh, of uh, uh, people planning uh, in the community and social workers stepping into the community and really being able to operate um, in, in, in the flow of their, their strength-based work and those values of community. And there's just one little example. One little example is um, Alice, um, and there's a film on YouTube about this. So if, if you searched um, Alice Family Group Conference, you'd see this film. So Alice. Um, lived in Bloomsbury uh, for a long time, moved to the UK from Ghana um, in the 60s and she used to be the caretaker of this block of flats in Bloomsbury. Um, as time went on, her husband died, um, her life circumstances changed um, and also the support around her changed um, quite gradually I think. Um, but uh, when one of the um, um, response team social workers now to meet Alice um, you know, she was depressed and uh, um, she did need some help but she didn't want um, a social worker what she talked about was her life as a caretaker and all the things that were important to her and so the family group conference the uh, social worker referred for a family group conference and one was organized for Alice and it wasn't um, actually Alice's family that came was that community around her, her other people that lived with her in the um, in that block of flats, and uh, they had a wonderful family conference, and people stepped up to 
um, take her to the um, to a regular counselling appointment, to take her to see um, her husband's grave. Uh, one of the neighbours um, was dropping flowers on the doorstep once a week, and she had this kind of reconnection. Uh, with the um, uh, with the people in her life, which was really important and, and fundamental for her. Thanks, Tim. Really, uh, really compelling stuff. Uh, I'd like to take a, a question uh, from the audience now. Uh, do do uh, feed your questions through as we go. If there are things of particular interest you'd like to hear the panelists' thoughts on, um, we have one here. Uh, let's have a look. Any? Uh, what is the panel's thought on FGC as an approach which supports anti-racist practice? Um, Kathy, maybe I come to you and then, and then Pete on this one. Yeah, I think um, FGC has over the years really shown itself to be a hugely culturally sensitive approach. Um, I mean, the wordle that came across, people were talking about empowerment. And I think it's, it's important for us to recognize in social work, how social work along with all of the other kind of helping professions and education and whatever our systems do actually often compound and reinforce the sort of stigma and disadvantage that a lot of um, black and minority ethnic communities face. Um, and it's, I think it's picking up on what Tim was saying about our system versus people's lives and how they live people's lives and the rigidity that can often be in our perceptions. And I think the really great thing about FGC is the way that it puts the family in the deciding seat, uh, in the driving seat about how the how they have a choice about how things are done with an FGC. So they can actually put their own imprint on how the, the, the work and the meeting takes place. And I think that's where that preparation by an independent person is so important. Somebody who's not assessing them and making judgments of them, but facilitating them to show the strengths that they have in their own ways and their own communities. Um, also, I mean, Tim mentioned here in London, we, we have a, we, we operate with a pool of independent coordinators, which means obviously we have very diverse populations. So it means we can offer choice of, you know, the FGC will be held in your language and the interpreter will be there for the social worker, which is, you know, quite a, a shift. So I, I think they can be really, really helpful in, in, in sort of opening up some of those um, perceptions. I mean, one of the other things using coordinators who um, are recruited from those com ethnic communities really sometimes opens up the network that a you know a social worker a white background social worker would not be able to do um, we had a case and it was uh, three children who were all going to go into long-term care because it was a somalian family um, as far as we knew, and the social worker had tried hard to get into who was around in the family who might help, but the family were very close and very suspicious and very anxious about authority coming into their lives. Um, and when we had a Somalian coordinator, I mean, it was just amazing. There were there were cousins in North London, there were cousins in Germany, there were people who came, the, the FGC was huge. And those three children all stayed within their family. And, you know, that just wouldn't have happened any other way, really. Thanks, Cathy. Uh, Pete, would you like to come in? Yeah, just a couple of thoughts, really. I mean, one, just to reinforce what Cathy is saying, about, about a kind of example about language I think really I mean if you were having a standard professional meeting as it were you might get an interpreter in to help the family to understand the professionals with an FGC you get an interpreter in to help the professionals to understand the family and I think that's that's a fundamental difference but the other point is of course these things uh, need to take place and we'll talk about it more later in a wider context uh, if you had a little island in which you're respecting people and 
being positive so far about all this, it's not much good if the decision that that little island takes is subsequently ejected by the biases and so forth, which are all around it. So it, 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 it certainly isn't the only answer to this particular issue. Thanks, Pete. Uh, if we could, we'll stay, stay with you for the next question. So <clears throat> FGC is basically a decision-making model. So it requires changes in professional views about decision-making and that the actions flowing from those decisions work well. Uh, what impact on service does this have? Perhaps you could give us your thoughts on that, Pete. That's quite nice, isn't it, Billy? The, uh, absolutely. I mean, the, um, you, you can't have a family-led decision-making model, which is, which is what it is. It isn't an intervention. It isn't a therapy. It's a family-led decision-making model in the middle, for instance, of a professional-led agency. And you aren't going to get the referrals to it, or you're going to get them, but they're not going to be distrustful, quite rightly, really of the fact that their views wouldn't be respected. And if the decisions themselves aren't taken forward in a way which makes sense with that sort of philosophy, a family-led philosophy, uh, we're not going to get very far. So I think we need to be absolutely clear. It's a heart and mind's job. It's a, it's a, it's a significant shift, uh, not just for the agency which is carrying it out, but also for the partner agencies. Because again, if you, if you kind of export the decision and particularly in, in perhaps in, in adult mental health areas, you're working with partner agencies. Those agencies too need to be on board this um, and, and uh, uh, working in a similar, but with similar values and in that, in that value-based way. So we need to make arguments to convince people. And I don't think those arguments ideally are regulatory arguments or, um, uh, or, or compulsion arguments. I, I think they're arguments which appeal to would appeal to everybody in this sector that this is an excellent way of helping children, families, adults um, that they like, uh, although they find it stressful, as of course one would, but they all say this is the right sort of thing to do, that it's, that it's decent, you know, that it's, it's, it's correct, it's, it's, it's respectful. And I think also something about citizens and states that, you know, when the state is is intervening as it can very powerfully, particularly with, with children um, or where it's controlling significant services. You know, citizens have an absolute right to be very heavily involved in that, in that kind of process. Um, so, you know, you need various things to go on with an agency to this, I think. Obviously training, training and materials, um, but also things that they do internally, a bit like that shift between having a translator um, for the professionals or having a translator for the family, um, they, they demonstrate in other sorts of ways that they're family-led, you know, perhaps have family-led reviews of services, um, that they perhaps publish something in connection with conferences, a bit like that stuff you sometimes see in a shop or something, uh, you know, um, you said we did stuff, so that, you know, you've got something coming out of the FGC which was requesting perhaps a bit of a different service and every now and again the agency is, is is reviewing that and saying well you did ask for this and you know we did our best to 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 provide it or we, we couldn't in in whatever way so it, it, it needs to permeate that also and that is quite a slow process I don't think anybody successfully introduces that kind of thing um, within weeks I don't think within months either it's, it's almost certainly within years so I mean these the it, it needs to change the whole agency, really. It is, it is that big. Uh, Cathy, Tim, anything to add to Pete's thoughts on that one? If not, we've got another question here uh, that I'll take from the audience. Uh, we've heard about restorative practice and the power of language. <clears throat> Excuse me. Have you experienced any negative connotation with the word conference? Some of our families who have experienced child protection meetings, the term conference makes them feel anxious and suspicious to the end of the meeting. Yeah, I think I think this is a really interesting one. And um, in England, the the term family good conference um, is used by all has been used over a period of time by almost all uh, family good conference projects. In Scotland, they um, talk about some family group decision making. In Wales, it's gone in and out and changed a bit, but often um, 
projects have talk, have used um, family group meeting. I think um, it is problematic. I know, I mean, actually developing the uh, family group conference work with adults, we've often been challenged on family as well, you know, um, and the fact that the, the term family is, 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 too, is too limiting. Um, I feel we got, to, for me, um, being connected to a sort of global community of practice and associating ourselves with the origins of of FGC in uh, in New Zealand um, and uh, Maori people is is really um, a key one and um, it I know P Pete might want to come in on this but I mean I've heard you say uh, before Pete that the word conference does sort of connote respect and is it is something that's more than a meeting and so how do you you know lang language is difficult and fluid isn't it but um i don't think fam group conferences is 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 perfect um but um i think the the advantages of um of being connected to all the other people around the world that are doing uh, are doing fgc and understand that term is um is significant for me and the skill always i mean family group conferences can be come across as quite an abstract thing you know to me it's this wonderful um you know beautiful you know uh, uh constellation of connection and human experience but when 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 one social worker is explaining it to another person um then they need to really um they need to do that well and they need to do that individually and in context all of those conversations um, about involving people in work or that offer um, to have a family group conference are all are all sort of um, situational. Yeah, can I, can, can I come in on that? I mean, I think it does cut both ways. That's absolutely true. I mean, I have heard people say that they value the term conference precisely because that's what professionals do, and this time they're they're doing it and they've got that sort of power with it. Um, on the other hand, the project. I worked with in Italy, substituted Conferenza, the Italian term of conference, because it had too much of a professional overtone uh, with Reunioni, which is Italian for meeting. So, uh, yeah, you know, I think Tim's absolutely right. We do need to make that connection worldwide. And we do need to describe what we do because we have certainly run the risk, particularly in the States, of people claiming that they're doing FTC work when lately, obviously, they're just sticking a couple of parents in the room and telling them what to do. You know, <laughs> it's really not the same thing. Kathy, did you want to come in on that one? Oh, we haven't got sound, Kathy. Oh, um, it's all right. We're on. We're on. <laughs> right. um, yeah, I'd, I'd endorse what, what other people are saying. I think that notion of um, my experience, obviously, the the when at the very beginning we were talking about the importance of preparation and the work of the independent coordinator to really explain what FGC is about. But I'd, I'd agree that I think, um, in my experience, families, once they've got that idea, actually feel that it is a respect to them. It has a status as opposed to just a meeting. Um, and I think it's also quite helpful to distinguish, I mean, as social workers, we convene family meetings a lot of the time. Um, and I think it's important to, you know, that there is this recognition of this, this process. So yeah, not perfect, but I, you know, in my experience, it's been overcome pretty well. And um, sometimes it really has a very positive sort of status in the minds of families. Right, thank you. And thanks for uh, that question. We've got a few more questions coming through, which we'll take in the, the general Q&A final sort of, uh, question from me for this uh, session. There's been a great deal of research and evaluation of FGC. If you were able to sponsor a project now, what particular areas do you think it should investigate? And uh, who'd like to kick us off? We'll go open plan with this one. Who'd like to kick us off with an answer on this? Tim. Uh, yeah, I could say that um, <clears throat> one of the things that's been really interesting about recent FGC work both with adults but also in the area of early help is looking at the so i think fg practice fgc practice um in england in particular but in the uk perhaps across the board has been um located in that 
edge of care area that's where most of the fgc work's been done and in that's in and in in that context you're sort of talking about a strong um uh, there's the, the there are there are professional worries and concerns that families are needing to uh, to respond to if you take the fgc process and the, and the offer of fgc earlier in the life of problems um then you have a meeting which is more about uh, where the the agenda um is more uh, co-created uh, with with families with young people um and you and you um get fgcs which are not just about responding to immediate concerns and sort of emergency decision making but you get um the fgc process being about people's life hopes about what they want to see in the medium term um, and sort of ex more a vivid expression of their life um, and um, that community of people around them and Kathy touched on this with lifelong links earlier so I think I, I did get I, I saw a message run across my screen from um, Becca Dove who's a really um, valued uh, colleague and friend of mine uh, she's done some brilliant work as the um, head of early help and family support in Camden so um, look up uh, stuff that she's done but yeah the the, the early help um, the adult work they're interesting areas because it's shifting that focus and looking at FGC earlier in the life of problems. Thanks to Pete you're going to come in there I think. Yeah I mean I, I, would, I would love to see more things about what is really the heart of, of FGC uh, uh, about citizenship and engagement and rights and responsibilities and how that's really working out. I mean, we know from um, team studies that you know, families feel in general it's the right thing to do. But how far is that really um, followed through? Um, how far do other agencies feel that? Um, I think we should definitely not do more research, which is trying to look at things that FGCs are, are not meant to do. You know, we're not there particularly affect numbers in care or something. Um, uh, I think it's an interesting area where you don't have them, um, partly we've tried to have them but don't have them, which is not fantastically common, but it is intriguing. Do people take this off themselves and, and do their own kind of FGC? What, what happens around those sort of areas? So yeah, I think that, that would be my uh, additional thoughts to them for the moment. Oh, and I had one other actually, which is that open dialogue in mental health is, is a very interesting new model which is being tried and tested throughout the UK uh, very much about the professional mental health experts um, constantly engaging in a diagnostic dialogue with the um, individuals uh, that they're trying to help and I would like to see some interesting work contrasting that really and seeing what the strengths are of each and they've got some fantastic training models which um, I think we could also look at. Great thanks Pete. Cathy did you want to comment on that one? Um, yeah, I think the, the bit that I would really be interested in seeing is some work on what are the organisational barriers, the system barriers to FGCs. I mean, this, as Pete says, there's been lots of work on FGCs. Yes, they work. Yes, families like them. We get effective plans. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of focus. Do they save money? You know, and, and that's a, a, a valid point as well. But in, in the years I've been involved, it's quite interesting as to where FG, you know, which organisations FGCs thrive in, which they don't. I mean, I'm, I'm sure anyone who's been involved with FGC will also know, you know, there are social workers who will refer and refer, and there are social workers, although they would never say it was a bad thing, never ever refer. Um, so I, th I think something about, you know, what is going on in social work practice and how we relate to families uh, within those systems and organisations would be really interesting to see what is a fertile ground for FGC and what is a hostile ground. Right. Thank you. Right. Well, we've had some. Uh, thank you for your answers on those questions so far. We've had some really good questions coming in. We've got about 15 minutes left. We will finish promptly at 11. So. We'll try and get through as many of these as we can. Um, I don't think we'll get through them all, but we'll see what we can do. Um, so uh, we've got one here. In, in Stockton, uh, we have been running FGC for three years and are well embedded. We are co-located with frontline social work teams, which has brought benefits in terms of becoming embedded. But I worry about the impact on our independence. 
I'd welcome the panel's views on whether they feel we should separate the FGC team from the social work teams. Any thoughts on that panel? Maybe I could, I could kick it off with a slightly salutary tale, which I suspect many of the people listening to this will know, but in New Zealand, they were very independent at the actual start and, um, and then got much more incorporated into teams and, and FGC practice had to be reinvigorated after that. Uh, I think it is extremely important that there is a, a strong element of independence in there. I mean, exactly how it's enacted, I think can be different. And one other thought about that, think from the family outwards you know families definitely respond completely differently to somebody who in in no way has responsibility for service or is directly connected with service or and can, can genuinely say you know i stand um, alongside but separate from uh, the kind of services which you're, which you're getting i mean and one can achieve that in a variety of different ways but it's certainly a, a key issue yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that entirely. I think the, um, it's very, it can be very difficult for family group conference coordinators to be too close to social workers. Um, obviously, you need a positive and a good working relationship with social work colleagues and they need to feel a confidence in the coordinator. But I think when you're co-located, it's so easy for them to see you as one of them. Um, it's often uh, when, when uh, FGC teams are in that situation, they're required to record on systems in a way that perhaps an independent coordinator, because you know, obviously they're not going there to make observations and whatever. So I think those lines can sometimes be blurred. And, and it's also, uh, one of the things I've found over the years with FGC is that Sometimes social workers see it as a tool of theirs. You know, it's, it's their tool to achieve their ends. Um, and, you know, while obviously we're all trying to work to a similar uh, goal and, and outcome, but I think that, you know, the difference between it being a, a process with the family, a right that they have to be involved versus a tool that social workers, right, well, I'll do this now because I want to see what, what they can give to support the plan that I'm making. And there's that sort of difference between, and it was interesting because I'm, uh, I'm a tutor on an accreditation program for FGC coordinators. And I was recently observing an FGC and the family had come back with their, their plan and what they were going to do and all the rest of it. Um, but they also had a number of things that they had down that they would like the social worker to do to support their plan. Uh, and they were all perfectly valid things. Um, and the social worker's response I found very disappointing because it was, this meeting is about what your network can do, not what about, not what I should be doing. And, you know, that I think that really kind of encapsulates that sometimes it can be too much of a, uh, a social work tool, if you like. Um, so I think that that's one of the dangers. There are advantages in being co-located, but I think it's it can be quite difficult to keep that separation. I, th I think um, um, I agree with uh, with Cathy in the main, but for the sake of in a bit of a devil's advocate argument i've worked in um fgc project local authority um fgc services also in a, i worked in a little um project called family circle when i first qualified as a social worker and it was lovely you know you phone people up and go hello it's tim from family circle can i come and see you and talk about you know and it was a small charity and um the ability to build trust um, was really enhanced by actually our um, impact overall on, um, you know, uh, outcomes for children in Cardiff, where the project was, was quite low. Um, and I think the, uh, we sometimes fall into the mode of saying, of giving all of the credit and outcomes from the FGC to the family and, and sort of really loading up on it being this kind of family rights approach which i think it is i think it is challenging mainstream practice 
I think it is challenging the system um, to be more rights focused and, um, and listen to the voice of parents and children more. But it's got to be a kind of balance for me and um, the social worker that really gets FGC and takes it on and makes lots of referrals and uses it as, an, as a space for that strength based old school social work is comfortable stepping into the community, being with people and, 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 and making decisions together, I think is also needs to be valued. So it is a balance. Tim, if we could, we'll stay with you for, we have uh, another question here um, uh, around the sort of mental health aspect of things. So given the increase in mental health issues and the stresses within families, how are young people being emotionally supported through this process and is this adequate? Yeah. I mean, people are, are, are best emotionally supported by their families and their, and, and, and their communities um, is a key um, value of a family good conference. And of course, what family good conference um, enables is that blend of enough professional support at the right time, that safeguarding element of the um, referring professional, being able to um, kind of talk to that wider group of people around uh, somebody that needs help. Um, and I mean, I'm thinking about some of the FGC work we've done recently with um, uh, children in need. Um, children, in, we looked at, um, particularly looked at the group from 10 to 13. So um, before things escalate um, um, and um, looking, w working out, trying to build up the FGC process with them around who are the trusted adults in their life. You know, is there a, a, a mentor, a, a youth worker, a, a teacher um, that's a trusted adult for them? Um, and them being, um, you know, an influencer within that, um, within that network. Um, and a connector between the um, social worker that might be wanting to really connect with that young person but might be a little bit more removed um, and also that family group um, um, around them. Um, so um, yeah really thinking carefully and creatively about the mix in the FGC and I, I know there are lots of local authorities that are doing really interesting work in that area. Great stuff, thank you. Cathy, uh, one for you here, I think. Uh, are FGCs a social work tool or a human right? Your thoughts um, on that? Yeah, as, as I say, I think that's that's really what was coming up for me with the, the question about being co-located, that um, it's great that FGCs are much more embedded in what we do. Um, but I think picking up on Pete's point about what happened in New Zealand, it, it really depends on that overall um, kind of approach and overall idea about how we are working with people and what is the best way for us as social work professionals to help them um, find the solutions to the difficulties that they're in. And um, I think the, the danger is that you can have FGC as a bolt on, and I think that has been the case initially, I think, um, quite a bit of the time when FGCs were first being introduced, the, as a bolt on, and, and this is a way of the professionals getting some kind of better buy-in and contribution to a largely professional driven plan um, and sort of seeing the FGC as, as that kind of mechanism really as a, a part of the sort of social work uh, toolbox. Um, and while they have a value in even in that context, you know, it, it is better than not having that kind of input. I think the shift that we've sort of come to now is really much more a shift in, in the overall sort of thinking about how we engage with families and what is the right way to treat people. And actually that, you know, in, in the example I I gave about the observation that bit about it being a co-creation about us hearing 
from families about how we can help them best is is a really important thing and i think that really connects as well with the whole black lives matter and the, the sort of focus on um, our work with different communities that you know we need to hear their perspective on what is helpful for them rather than us taking it off our shelf you know this is the program that is good for this and this is the program that is good for that so um yeah yeah that's kind of what i would say about that one Oh, you're muted, David. Thank you, school boy error. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Pete, sorry, I think this one's for you. Would you like to see this introduced as a compulsory element for serious decisions in childcare? Uh, that's been a naughty one, hasn't it? I mean, people have uh, talked about that at some length. I, um, I think probably the short answer is no. That I think really, I, I personally, I mean, I think there are arguments for it. I mean, obviously that, that would be a way which would unleash some resources around training and so on. It would focus people's minds and, and make people do it. It would kind of move towards the rights argument, I suppose, um, with it. But I, I actually want to see people convinced about this, really. And I want to see them understand that this is right. I think if you get to the heart of um, most social work brains, as it were, <laughs> and most social care thinking, people think it is the right thing to do. Cathy's absolutely right that, you know, some people think it's the right thing to do and don't do it. <laughs> but um, I, I, I would prefer to see, you know, and a really powerful movement. I mean, a bit like in, say, disability, you know, nothing about us without us, those kind of um, powerful statements. And, 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 and really, uh, I, I'm sure that would be taken on, on, on board well. Again, to come back to one of Cathy's comments, no doubt a bit more in some agencies than in others. But in short, I, I don't think I personally would like to see legislation, certainly not at the, um, at the sort of social work end, whether or not at the sort of grand country end in the Netherlands, it is regarded more as something which helps citizens engage with the state generally. And it's, it's at a, a much higher level of, of law, maybe there. Great, thanks Pete. Well, um, probably time for us to start wrapping this up. So we hope you found the discussion uh, of interest. A recording will be available on our website in coming days. Uh, so we'll let you know when that goes up and if you think colleagues will be interested, please direct them to it. And finally, it just, just remains for me to thank today's contributors for sharing their expertise, insight and experience. Peter, Cathy, Tim, thank you so much. And thank you to all of you for joining us and for your questions today. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, goodbye. Mm -hmm.